Good morning. Good morning. If you will stand with us as we sing our call to worship this morning. It's hymn number 12. Praise him, praise him. We'll sing the first and the last. You know, as uh, we gather today uh, for church, uh, the world uh, has its, uh, has its uh, attention and focus on uh, Ukraine and uh, what's taking place there. And, and uh, many of you, as you have watched the news, um, you have seen that uh, eight years of ongoing conflict has now uh, come to a head and, uh, and war has taken place um, in that country. You know, I just kind of wanted uh, this morning to remind us of something that uh, Jesus has said when he was asked about the last days. And in Matthew uh, chapter 24, uh, Jesus said, nation will rise against nation and uh, kingdom against kingdom. There will be wars and there will be rumors of wars. There will be famines and there will be earthquakes in various places and all of these things are, are like birth pains. He goes on to say that the church is going to be persecuted. The church will be hated by all nations. So many will turn from their faith. There will be false prophets. There will be increase in wickedness. And the love of many people will grow cold. And then he says this, And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So as we, as we look at our world and as we look at the conflict that takes place, as we look at uh, the, the tensions, where should our, our focus really lie? And you know, as Christians, as Jesus says, the gospel should be preached to all nations. You know, that's really our focus, isn't it, is the gospel. And also the fact that the things that take place in the world are by God's sovereign hand, and we should pay attention because at any moment, his coming is at hand. It says in chapter 24, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So you must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect it. And you know, as, as we look at our world, I think that's you know a great word for us as Christians, to... Pay attention to what we're called as the gospel, to share the gospel, to live the gospel, and also to pray, to pray for our world. Um, <clears throat> we have a prayer guide in the foyer by Sin Relief, 
and I, I would like this morning to, to take some time and to just pray for uh, the, the crisis and the situation in the, uh, that's taking place in Ukraine. And so there's prayer guide in the foyer if you'd like to pick one up. If you would like to contribute or to help uh, in some way, uh, sinrelief.com is a great way to go if you would like to give or to contribute or to help in some way for, for the people uh, of Ukraine. But what are some of the things that we can pray for uh, this morning for them? Um, we can pray specifically for the people of Ukraine. Pray for their strength and their courage and their perseverance as, as their homes are threatened. Uh, we can pray for safe passage uh, out of these conflict zones. Um, you know, they're looking at a humanitarian crisis of millions of people being displaced from their homes uh, through this war. And um, we can pray uh, for those people that, that are going to be dealing with uh, the trauma that takes place with war. We need to pray for our local churches and for relief workers, humanitarian and aid organizations as, as they try to step up and, and to care for people and, and, um, and to help and to provide uh, uh, not only resources but also the gospel. And we need to pray for Ukrainian believers that as they go through all of this, that, uh, that they will be able to uh, share the light of Christ in, in the midst of uh, this, this dark time. And then ultimately... We need to pray for people, uh, not only Ukrainians, uh, but Russians as well, that people will get saved and, and people will come to know Christ because as, as we just sang, you know, this, this, is, uh, uh, he, he's, this is his world, he's coming again, and, uh, and people need to know him. And so would you stand with me as, as we pray today for, for these various needs? Lord, we stand in your presence today, and, and Lord, we very humbly acknowledge that the things that are taking place in, in our world are, are so complicated, and they're way beyond uh, what we can understand or, or comprehend. And Lord, we don't, we don't know not only the hearts of man and, and the courses of nations and why choices are made and and wars are started, and, and all of this. But we do know that you are sovereign. We know, Lord, that as we've seen through your, your scriptures and, and through your word, Lord, you are sovereign, and you are moving history to a specific point. Lord, we'll, we're, we're, Jesus will come again and establish his eternal kingdom and reign forever. And Lord, we are called as your people Lord, on an individual basis, Lord, to, to, to love others and, and to care for others and to share the gospel about the Prince of Peace and about the coming kingdom. And Lord, today we, we do pray for, for the Ukrainian people. We pray for their leaders and the government. Lord, we, we pray for these people that, that, that are facing such a threat on their life and their home and their land. And so many of them that will be displaced, Lord, and, and lose everything. And, Lord, we pray for your grace for them. And we pray for your light to shine. And we pray for believers, Lord, in the church in Ukraine, Lord, to, to be the backbone uh, of, in that country, Lord, in this time. Lord, we pray for, for the Russian leaders. We pray uh, for, for guidance and we pray for grace and we we pray that, that, these, that this conflict will be solved without, uh, in peaceful manners instead of bloodshed. And Lord, we pray overall, Lord, that, that, that the gospel will come forth as, as the light of the world and the hope in which, which we all have. Lord, I thank you for, for the local churches and the organizations and, and all of those that step up and minister and serve. And we pray that you would empower them through the presence of your spirit, to be light, Lord, in the darkness. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
you'll now turn to 329. That's our next hymn. There's power in the blood. over to 3.30. Our offertory hymn is Are You Washed in the Blood? We'll sing the first and the last. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day you've given us and this opportunity to come out and worship you. We do thank you for those you've called to lead us, our ministers. Father, I pray that you would be with them as they minister to us today. Father, I pray that your spirit will be laid out upon each and every one of us and we'd be open to receive it, Father. And through that challenge of your spirit, Father, we would go out into this world and lead others to Christ. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity as you've given us to show our faith in you by giving our tithes and our offerings. And I pray that we would really know the difference between tithing and our offerings, Father. And I pray that we would give in accordance to your will and your word. In Christ our Savior's name we pray. Amen.
you'll join us in singing our special music today. It's hymn number 343, Amazing Grace. We'll sing the first, second, and last. down on the way up here. <laughs> Good morning, friend Chip. Um, probably don't have to introduce myself, but I am Sharon Lambert. I want to plug three different things today. Um, the first is our ladies' craft night. We will be meeting the same night that the Brotherhood's going to be up here. Um, so men can be over at one side and women on the other side, and y'all can go home together, ride together. Uh, but we tend to talk and visit and fellowship, so uh, you might have to wait on us. But it is uh, March 7th, yeah, March 7th at 6 p.m. There is a sample in the foyer, in the little foyer, uh, if you want to see, but you do it you, your way. Uh, the next is the Phyllis Shirer uh, Bible study that's going to be in Jackson April the 9th. Uh, if anybody wants to go, I'm going to be purchase, purchasing the tickets next week. Uh, we'd love to have you just fellowship with each other on the ride up there and uh, get something to eat and uh, learn something. The other one is the care ministry. Now, y'all know how it was before COVID. You know, we had uh, four teams come and send out cards, uh, maybe make visits, calls, and that's what we want to do now, except we're only meeting on Sunday 
and Wednesday night, we will just have two teams. But you're going to send out cards to uh, sympathy cards, get well cards. Uh, we're going to send out cards for, I mean, it's not all bad. We're going to send out cards for those that uh, have been baptized. And, uh, you know, we're going to make some calls. It's not just going to be sending out cards. We want uh, to get in contact with our visitors. And that's one thing. Uh, when I was secretary, I wished everybody would do. If you have not ever in your life turned in one of those little side cards on uh, your bulletin that you tear off, please fill it out so we can have a record uh, of your address, your phone number. If you don't want us to call you, go ahead and put your phone number and say, no, don't call me. But uh, we might call you anyway. But there's the box in the foyer for you to put any information on that. On the other side is if you have anybody that needs prayed for, you know, we can do that. We're going to hope to go into the uh, prayer room right next door to the care room and pray for uh, whoever needs to be prayed for. We're going to pray for our church and pray for our pastor and uh, pray for our church family. Uh, let me think. I wish I'd have written my notes on my hand like I did in school. <laughs> uh, something else that the care ministry does is uh, we're in charge. Well, the care ministry, not necessarily everybody that's on that, but uh, it concerns feeding the ladies that have had surgery. And uh, if you want to sign up for that, let me know. Uh, it is a great ministry, you know, because the ladies, you know, if you've ever had surgery, you know what they need. And her kids still need to eat, and she needs the rest. So if you're interested in... Uh, helping with that, just let me know. So that was the three things. Okay, we're going to have a meeting in March for those who uh, want to know more about the care ministry. All right, thank you, Miss Sharon. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, if you'll turn there. Matthew chapter 9. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we've been talking about uh, lessons for life, uh, learning from the parables uh, of, of Jesus. And uh, actually, three short parables that he gives in succession today. And we're going to talk about, talk about those. Let me ask you this. How much of what you do in your Christian life is based on tradition and how much of what you do in your Christian life is based on the truth of Christ that is transforming your life? When you think about tradition, we all have them. I mean, tradition is a human thing. If you do something really more than once, uh, it starts to become a tradition. And traditions aren't all bad. Traditions unify us. Uh, traditions kind of add to our identity and those types of things. So tradition isn't a bad thing, so to speak. However, tradition can take the place of truth. And, and we can come to a point in our lives where we are living according to tradition rather than according to the truth of Christ. What tradition does is tradition maintains, but truth transforms. And so many people in their Christian life have been doing the same thing their whole life. And they're no more like Jesus than when they were baptized because they're going through a tradition of a Christian life rather than living by the truth of Christ because truth transforms you. Tradition just maintains you. And you also think about it in this sense. 
tradition, and, and when I talk about tradition, it basically means the way we do church, or kind of the, the way we go through uh, the Christian life, the things that we think are important. And when, when you look at that, oftentimes truth, uh, tradition is about continuing a ritual. You know, we sing this many songs, uh, we sing these types of songs, we worship this type of way, we take up the offering here, we do this, we do this, we do this. Uh, you know, those are traditions, right? Um, and tradition is about continuing a, a ritual. But truth, truth is about connecting you in a relationship with Jesus. And so... As today we, we look at these parables, I really want you to think about the fact that is your Christian life, is it just based on a tradition? Or is your Christian life a, a living relationship that's based on the truth of Christ that's actually transforming your life? So, let's start with this illustration. There was a very uh, poor, holy man who lived in a remote area of China. And every day uh, before his time of meditation, um, <clears throat> in order to show his devotion to God, he would put a dish of butter in the windowsill as an offering to God, since food was so scarce at that time. Well, one day his cat came along and ate the butter. Well, I don't like cats. So his cat comes along and he eats the butter. So to remedy this, this issue, the holy man began tying his cat to the bedpost each day before his quiet time. Now, this man was very revered uh, in, his, in his community, in his village, and people highly respected his spiritual life and his walk with God. And so many people came to, to mimic him and kind of follow him and be a disciple, and, and they wanted to worship as he worshiped. So generations later, long after this holy man was dead, his followers still placed an offering of butter in the windowsill during their prayer time and devotion. Furthermore, each one bought a cat and tied it to the bedpost. What kind of religious traditions do we hold on to? You know, when you come to, when you come to Scripture, there was, there's a tension in the Gospels between the religious traditions of the Jewish people and the person of Jesus, the truth of Jesus. And although Jesus was fulfilling all of the signs, you could go down the checklist of the Old Testament prophecies, and although he was fulfilling all of the signs that he was the promised Messiah, he wasn't keeping many of those religious traditions like the Pharisees and the other uh, religious people were. And this brought him into great conflict with the religious community because Jesus didn't hold to some of these traditions that they had regarding regulations for the Sabbath day. And in that particular time, uh, the Pharisees, uh, through their interpretation of the law, had came up with all of these regulations for how you keep the Sabbath. They had it down to, to the fact of how many steps you could take on the day of the Sabbath, that you couldn't spit on the ground on the Sabbath day, because if you spit on the ground, that created mud, and that was an act of work. And, and you couldn't do anything, you know, that, that, that had an act of work or creation to it. So they had all of these regulations. They had hundreds. I believe I read somewhere it was over 300 and something regulations on how a person was to keep the Sabbath day. And they believed that, that they were made right with God, that they were forgiven, and all of this through these traditions, through these rituals that they kept. But not only was it conflict with tradition on the Sabbath, but they had ceremonial washings of, of their hands, they had weekly fastings, and then they obviously had a problem because not only did Jesus break these traditions regarding uh, the Sabbath and regarding ceremonial washings and fastings, but he also associated 
with some pretty bad people. I mean, he would go to a tax collector's house. He would have contact with a prostitute. I mean, he would associate with sinners. And obviously, obviously a man of God wouldn't do that according to the religious leaders of their day. And so Jesus has these conflicts because he was confronting their tradition with his truth. So this is, let me give you one more example. When you look in Luke chapter 13, you'll find that Jesus shows up at the synagogue. Now, at the synagogue that particular day, as, as normal uh, for this particular lady, she came to the synagogue to worship God. This lady was crippled in her back. She was bent over, and Jesus said that she had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. This woman was suffering. And there on the Sabbath, that particular moment, in the midst of all, all of the people, Jesus heals this precious lady. Interestingly enough, the Pharisees, the Bible says, became indignant. They were angry. They were infuriated that Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. And the synagogue leader said, there are six days to work. Why do you come on the Sabbath to get healed? Because that was an act of creation, healing. And so Jesus had obviously broke their tradition of the Sabbath, their interpretation of it. This is what Jesus told them. Jesus said, you are hypocrites because how many of you will untie your donkey or your mule and lead it to water on the Sabbath and yet here's this poor precious woman, shouldn't she be set free on the Sabbath? And you see, he's basically saying because your traditions have blinded you to the truth of God, you don't even understand the true meaning of the Sabbath and, and, and its purpose for worship and connecting with God in a way that transforms your life. And, and I wonder how many of us miss the transforming truth of God in our life because we're living by a tradition. We're going through a motion. And when we come to the parables of Jesus today, this is basically what he is addressing. He is confronting their interpretation uh, of the scripture. He's confronting their traditions and he's also saying, hey, I'm the one that you look to. I'm the one who's fulfilled everything in the Old Testament and I'm the one you're to follow. So look with me here in Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 14. Then John's disciples came, that's John the Baptist, he had his following too, then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And what they're referring to is this. In their tradition, religious tradition, the Pharisees and John's uh, disciples also are he held to this tradition. They fasted. They had two fasts per week. And so that's what they're referring to. And interestingly enough, in the Old Testament, there is only one fast that is commanded for the people of God, for Israel, and that is on the Day of the Atonement. That's the only one that's commanded in Scripture. It's one, it's a national, and it's for one day. But their tradition, they were fasting twice a week. And so this had became a standard of supposedly a, a religious, godly person. So they asked Jesus, well, why don't your disciples do this? And so he gives him three parables in response. Jesus answered, How can the guest of the bridegroom, who is Jesus, mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom is taken from them, and then they will fast. Jesus didn't say there's anything wrong with fasting. Fasting has its purpose in, in seeking God personally and confessing sin and seeking God personally. But you can fast and still be far from God. And what Jesus is telling them is this. Hey, the bridegroom, I am the one that the Old Testament prophesied about. I'm here. And just like you, you don't have a fast at a wedding, that's a celebration, that's a feast. My disciples are with me. 
And they are receiving truth in their life, and that is a celebration. Look what he says here. He goes on to say, and this, and this adds to his point that he is the one who fulfills the Old Testament law. Now, he is the one that we are to follow. He says in verse 16, No one sews a patch on an unshrunk cloth of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Now, some of you folks that sew may understand exactly what he means there. But I just kind of have to take his word for it. I don't sew. But it makes sense, right? So you put a new patch on an old garment, it's not going to work. Neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins, for if they do, the skins will burst, for the wine will run out and the skins will be ruined. So in the fermentation process, you put new wine and old skins through that process, it's going to burst those old skins, he says. So no, they pour new wine into new skins, and both are preserved. So what picture is Jesus giving them here? He is actually, you know, through these three parables, Jesus is actually teaching the most important truth of all of Scripture. He is. And here's that most important truth. Jesus is the bridegroom. The imagery of the Old Testament is God's people Israel as the bride and the coming Messiah as the bridegroom. And Jesus is saying, I am the promised Messiah. I'm the one who fulfills the Old Testament law. I am the one who establishes the new covenant that was promised by God by the Old Testament prophets. And he's telling us, he says, through faith in Jesus alone is how we're made right with God. So knowing the truth of who Jesus is and following him is what brings you into a right relationship with God and transforms your life as a child of God. So that's why these parables teach the most important truth of all of Scripture. Jesus is saying, it's all about me, is what he's saying. My truth, the truth of who I am, and how my truth transforms your life. So let's, let's mention three things about this real quick. The first is this. When, when you read these parables, the first thing that should jump out at us is the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus. Who he is. Now, no doubt Jesus was a remarkable person. But I want you to consider a few things. Jesus was born in obscurity and poverty. Little town of Bethlehem, right? To two poor people. He didn't begin his earthly ministry until he was 30 years old. He never traveled more than 200 miles from his hometown. He never set foot in a big city. He never wrote a book like you would think, like a self-help book, something of that nature. He never led an army. His ministry only lasted three years. He was executed in, in the most humiliating, defeating way on a Roman cross. Yet over 2,000 years later, no other person who's ever lived has ever impacted the world like Jesus. I mean, that should, that should be enough to make everyone in here believe in and on itself. And there's one reason. There's one reason why he's had the impact upon this world that he's had. And that's because he is the person that God promised that would bring salvation to every man. It's the only reason. He is the promised Messiah. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way that you come to know God and have a relationship with God. And if you look with me in Jeremiah chapter 31, I want to show you another uh, most significant passage, one of the most significant passages of Scripture, Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. We're going to look at verses 31 through 34. Now, when, when we look at the person of Christ, we need to understand what's called covenant language. Uh, as a matter of fact, Old Testament means Old Covenant. New Testament means New Covenant. And 
This idea of a covenant is significant in all of Scripture because in the Old Testament, God established a covenant, and a covenant is a promise between two people, a a promise of, of, of faithfulness, a promise of loyalty, a promise of fulfillment, and it also has to do with a covering. So I promise... To, be, to cover your life with my loyalty, with my faithfulness, okay? Very similar to a wedding ceremony and to the vows that are shared. That is a covenant between two people. So what God did in the Old Testament was God established his covenant. He established that with Abraham. It was a promise that covenant would be fulfilled through the people of Israel, and he established his covenant with the people of Israel, and that came to fulfillment through the law of Moses. And then the promise of the covenant came unto David that said to David that a descendant of David would reign on the throne over the kingdom of God forever and ever. So you see this covenant promise in the Old Testament, and that that covenant was established through the law of Moses And the new covenant was promised to the prophets. So, let's look here in in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, this is one of the most significant passages of the Old Testament. And it is the longest quoted passage in the New Testament. And you'll find it quoted in uh, Hebrews chapter 8 as well as Hebrews chapter 10. And so, this is what the prophet Jeremiah says. And this is after God's people in the Old Testament. They had broke his covenant God brought judgment upon them. They were going into exile. And God reiterates to them the promise of the new covenant. And it says this, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, the law of Moses, when I took them out of the land and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. You see that relationship aspect that the covenant brings you into a, this personal relationship and God is like the husband. And so he, Jesus has said, hey, now I'm the bridegroom, okay? That's what Jesus is saying he is. Now look at verse 33. This is the covenant. This is the new covenant. This is what's going to come about. It's prophesied. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. So God is promising this new covenant that's going to come in a personal way, and now now his law is not going to be written on stone tablets. It's going to be written on the hearts of his people. There's going to be a new relationship with his spirit that's going to transform their life so that they can know God personally. No longer will... Will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. That is a personal knowledge. From the least of them to the greatest. That means that the preacher doesn't have any more insight into a relationship with God as the person in the pew. We're going to all know him in a personal way through the spirit of God that lives within us through our faith in Jesus. And then look at this. For I will forgive their sin. I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. So he's saying, I'm going to remove sin forever and I'm going to have a personal relationship with my people. I'm going to take care of sin and its consequences forever. This is going to be the new covenant. And it's going to come through a particular person, the Messiah. Jesus is saying, I'm that person. I'm the person. I fulfill fulfill the Old Testament law. I fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. I'm the one you're to believe in, and I'm the one you're to follow. And when you come to Jesus' talk with his disciples before he would go to the cross, it says that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. See, that's how the new covenant is going to be established. It was established through the sacrifice of Jesus. He said, this is my body which is given for you. And likewise, he took the cup, and after they had eaten, he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So Jesus is saying, I'm the person. I'm the person 
It's going to fulfill the Old Testament laws. I'm the person you're to believe in. I'm the person that's going to make you right with God. That was the very purpose of his coming. So we see not only in these parables the person of Jesus, who he is. He's the one to believe in. He's the one that establishes the new covenant. But we see the purpose of that. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. So go from Jeremiah 31 to Hebrews chapter 10. Here you see the purpose, because this is the ultimate purpose of Jesus' life. And that is to provide a means to remove sin. And that's exactly what the prophet said. He said that in this new covenant, I'm going to remember your sins no more. Now, when you go to the Old Testament, what had to take place? You had a tabernacle, and then you had a temple, and you had ongoing sacrifices, daily sacrifices, monthly sacrifices, festivals and feasts. You had all of these sacrifices of the Old Testament through the priest that were to atone for sin. In other words, they were... To, when that sacrifice was made, it acknowledged the sin of the people and it acknowledged the fact that God, that atonement for sin had to be made and that God's grace had to be given. But God says in the new covenant, sin's going to be taken care of. And that's exactly what Hebrews does. Now, if you want to understand, if you want to understand the new covenant, you read the book of Hebrews. Because Hebrews explains how everything in the Old Testament was a picture, a symbol, a type of Jesus, the Messiah to come. From the tabernacle, uh, even the, the law of Moses, to the tabernacle, to the priest, the sacrifices, it was all a picture of Jesus. Now, Jesus said, he put it this way in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He's saying, hey, I might not be keeping your traditions and your interpretation of the law. What I've done is I'm coming, and in my truth, I'm coming to fulfill the law. I'm going to fulfill the demands of the law for the penalty of sin, and I'm fulfilling all of the prophecies of the Messiah. So when you look at Hebrews chapter 10, you know, this is what you see. Now, beginning in, in chapter 9, verse 15, it says, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. In other words, he is now the, the one that you have a relationship with God through. It's through Jesus. And from that, the author expands upon that sacrifice of Christ in Hebrews chapter 10. And look with me there in verse 3, Hebrews chapter 10. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In other words, this was a reminder of the people's sin and their need for God, but it couldn't really take away the sin in their soul. It couldn't transform their life or give them a new heart. It had no power to do that. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, verse 5, and let's skip down a little bit. He said, verse 9, here I am, I have come to do your will. What was God's will? What was the purpose of Jesus' life? To make a sacrifice for your sin, to remove your sin before God so you could have a relationship with him. And then look at the next part of that. He sets aside the first, and you can say covenant, to establish the second. And how did he do that? And by your will, we have been made holy through the what? Sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. I want you to get this, this picture. I want you to understand Scripture and the significance of who Jesus is and his purpose. He came to be that once and for all sacrifice for your sin to make you right with God today and forever. 
And you read on in Hebrews 10, it, it says he's one sacrifice. He made one sacrifice that took care of the sin for good. So you could be forgiven. Your past, your present, even sins you're going to commit in the future. When your faith is in Jesus Christ, those sins no longer determine your destiny. Because you have a new identity in Christ. You are forgiven as a child of God. Now, let's think about it this way. Got to hurry. Y'all listen fast and I'll talk fast. Can we do that? Okay. So, picture it this way. The Old Testament, when you had the sacrificial system, you had to go all the time off these sacrifices, off these sacrifices. Picture it like this. Do any of you remember the old way to wash clothes with the washboard? Anybody remember that? Miss Katie, do you remember that? Isn't it good to have Miss Katie back with us? Anybody else, you remember the old washboard? Can y'all do that? Hey, dude. She remembers. All right, so did you like to do that? Was that fun? Have to get out there and scrub those clothes and bring them through the ringer and all of that? Now, something came about called electricity, and then somebody had the bright idea of a washing machine that brought a new power to washing clothes. Now, it would be kind of silly if you had access to a washing machine, but yet you're still using a washboard, wouldn't it? And so you see, in the Old Testament, it was like using that washboard. People had to go over and over and over and scrub and scrub and scrub to try to deal with sin in their life. But the new covenant came in Jesus, and it's like that power of the washing machine. You just throw them in, put in a little tide, and push the button, and they come out clean. You see... Jesus is the one that has the power under the new covenant. It's the purpose for why he came. And the Bible says in Galatians that the law, the whole Old Testament, the whole law of God, the very purpose was to lead us to Jesus, the one who could truly transform our life and who could truly deal with our sin forever and bring us into a relationship with God. So that takes us to the last thing that I want to mention to you. And I want to talk fast here, so... So uh, pay attention. So you got the person of Jesus, right? Who he is. He is the Messiah. He is the one who makes us right with God. We see, we see the, the purpose of Jesus, and he did that through his sacrifice upon the cross to, to remove sin forever so that we can have a relationship with God and, and we can be his holy people. And then third, you see the priority of Jesus, meaning that he is the one that you're to focus on, his truth. Now, traditions may be good, we may have them, that's great, but the truth of Jesus is what changes your life and the priority of Jesus. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus. In other words, he's got to be your priority, he's got to be your focus. Now, oftentimes people think, you know, well, man, my, my, my life is out of whack you know, I got, I'm struggling with this area of my life and this area of my life. I'm struggling with sin here. I'm struggling with these things. My life is so out of whack, and I hear this all the time, I need to get back in church. Now, what would you say to that? What would you say to that? There is some truth to that. I mean, yes, I mean, church is a good place to be, right? I mean, it's where we worship God. It's where we connect with God. It's where we find fellowship with one another. Yes, church is a good place to be. And a person who needs to come back in relationship with God, well, they do need to be in church. Yes. But I want you to hear this. That's not the starting point of what they need. They need Jesus. Not just get back in church. You can get back in church and still be out of whack because there's a lot of people out of whack that are in church. Because church can be about a tradition, but truth is about transformation. 
And when a person's life is out of whack, where they've got to start, the starting point is I need to focus on Jesus. I need Jesus. And listen to me. If you come to the truth of Christ in your life and you let that truth transform you, <laughs> you'll get back in church. It'll all fall in line. But we have to make sure that we're focusing on the purpose, on, on the person of Jesus and the purpose of Jesus and the priority of who Jesus is. That's what he's telling them in the parable. You can fast all you want, and it can just be a religious tradition. It doesn't mean it makes a difference in your life. Jesus is saying, hey, there's going to come a time I'm going to be gone. My believers will fast. They will seek me. They will do that. But... I'm the one you look to. I'm the one you believe in. I'm the one you follow. I'm the one who changes your life is what Jesus is saying. In Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says that he is the head of the body, the church. And that he is to have, listen to this, Colossians 1.18, first place in everything. Therefore, he's got to be the priority. And he established two things that are important, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those are the two ordinances that the Lord established in the New Testament. He didn't necessarily specify how you have a baptism service or how you conduct the Lord's Supper. Those are traditions. The ordinances are, these things are symbols that empower believers. And they show the priority of Jesus in your life. When you walk through those waters of baptism, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, and this is what the priority of Jesus means in your life. Are you ready? Here it comes. When Jesus is your priority, you put your faith in Him completely. You trust Him and Him alone. When He's your priority, you will follow Him obediently. Because love for God means that you want to obey God and please God. When Jesus is your priority, you're going to serve Him wholeheartedly. Your desire is going to be to do unto others as, as they do unto you. That you're going to serve others as you're serving Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13. When we make Jesus our priority, we're going to praise Him continually. When he's your priority, there's always something to praise God for. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 13, 15 through 16 says, Through Jesus, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And then lastly, you're going to witness for him faithfully. If he's your priority, you're going to, you're going to put your faith in him completely, you're going to follow him obediently. You're going to serve him wholeheartedly. You're going to praise him continually. And you will witness for him faithfully when he's your priority. So let's close with this. Not only did the Pharisees and the religious leaders have all of these traditions, one of those traditions were ceremonial washings. And those ceremonial washings were often done before meals when, when uh, people got together. Now, we wash our hands. We've learned a lot about washing hands. I didn't know you're supposed to wash hands for 20 seconds until COVID come along, right? So we've learned a lot about washing hands. And, uh, but I can tell you this. I wash my hands because I don't want to eat with germs on my hands. That's why I wash. You know, I don't want a germ. But they washed differently. Their washings were not because they wanted to clean their hands and have clean hands when they eat. Their washings were to symbolize that they were separate from the sinners of the world. And so if you were a religious person in Jesus' day, a Pharisee, and, and you had all your religious garb on so everybody would know how holy you were, um, if you walked by, and they had a certain distance, if you walked by a Gentile sinner, they consider that making you defiled. If you got in close proximity to a tax collector, you were defiled. So what they would do is they would have these ceremonial washings 
where they would come in and they have this big cert. They would wash. They would show that they have been cleansed from all the sinners in the world. So they will be separate, separate as the people of God. Well, Jesus didn't follow this tradition either. And so they want to know, well, why don't your, not only why don't your disciples fast, well, why don't they have all these cleansings that, that are the traditions? And Jesus told them, it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, it's what comes out. And then he told them something very point blank. He said, you have exchanged the commands of God and you are following the traditions of men. I want to ask you this morning, is your Christian life like that? Is it just about traditions because you maybe come to church every Sunday or every month or something like that? I mean, is it just about a tradition? Or are you seeking the truth of God that truly cleanses your heart? You know, David said, in dealing with his sin, David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. And what that meant was only God can make your heart right with him. But you have to surrender to him. And what Jesus is saying in these parables is this. I'm the one God promised. I'm the one you're to believe in. I fulfill the Old Testament. It's like an old wine skin. It's like an old piece of cloth. He said, I'm the one you're to follow. And it's my truth that changes your life. And you, and this is important too, you will understand all of Scripture when you understand who Jesus is. Because all of Scripture points to Him. And God's plan is, to cleanse your heart, and to save your soul through a relationship with Jesus. Do you have that relationship this morning? Or are you merely washing your hands and going through traditions? Lord, thank you for this day and the opportunity we have, Lord, to to look at your word, to study it together, and thank you for the truth that's in it. And Lord, I pray as we move to this time of invitation, Lord, that you speak to our hearts and that we respond in faith. Lord, you know what every heart needs here today. Lord, you know if our, if our faith is based on a tradition or if it's really grounded in the truth of who you are and what you've done for us and your plan for our lives. So, Lord, I pray, God, that, that we would come to that point where our focus is on you, that we fix our eyes on you, and we allow your truth to lead us, to guide us, to transform us, that we might be the people that you call us to be with a new identity and an eternal destiny. Would you stand with me? If God's laid a decision on your heart this morning, I'd be glad to pray with you about that decision. Maybe you need to come today and and confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe as a Christian you need to come and rededicate your life. Or or maybe God's speaking to you or calling you to, to a particular ministry, a particular service. And you want to surrender to that today. So however God is leading you, would you respond in faith this morning?